In southwestern France, along the Atlantic, lies a stretch of green ocean, the jewel of Gascony, the Land Forest. But just two centuries ago, this immense one million hectare pine forest did not exist. It was entirely man-made. The massive project covered this area of France with the largest artificial forest in Western Europe. Since its creation in the 19th century, this enormous plantation was meant to play a key role in French industry. But the forest is struggling to adapt to the 21st century with its countless upheavals. Without human intervention, it won't survive. And this dependence is weighing heavier and heavier on the tens of thousands of foresters who live off its timber. Today, more than ever, the forest needs to be reinvented, to strike a balance in a changing world. But man is at the heart of the Lond Forest. Will he manage to rise to the challenge? The Lond Forest owes its existence to a scourge that humans have always fought. Sand. To understand what's so unique about the Lond Forest in Gascony, the dune of Pilat offers a good perspective because it's highly symbolic. Sand is omnipresent here. We can see the contours and ripples of sand, the Lond territory stretching over a million hectares. You've got water to the west, the ocean with its mild, damp climate that bathes the entire region, and you've got the wind. There are three oceans here, the blue ocean, the Atlantic, the dune, an ocean of pale ochre sand, and the green ocean of the pine canopy. I love that time early in the morning or late at night when the dune has been swept clean of all traces. Everything marks sand. The tiniest bird, lizard or fox that passed here on its way to the ocean in the morning. Each creature leaves traces on the dune. The dune is a book where we can read everything that happened during the night. A dune is a giant on the move. With the ocean blocking it on one side, it uses the wind to advance relentlessly inland. Two centuries ago, there was nothing here to stop it. The sand advanced up to 40 meters inland per year, swallowing up swamps and pastures, houses and villages as it went. Tall beach grass was planted to stabilize the dunes, but it wasn't enough to halt the unstoppable daily progression. In the wake of the French Revolution, an engineer came up with a crazy scheme to create a huge forest that would act as a barrier to the dune. The tree he had in mind was an indigenous variety that was perfectly adapted to the sandy soil and climate of Aquitaine, the maritime pine. Maritime pines were artificially planted along the stretch of dune to keep it in place and prevent the dunes from advancing inland and engulfing the villages, which happened to several along the coast here, where churches and villages had to be moved as the sand progressed. 
Once we pass the handful of villages sprinkling the Londe coast, we find an immense heath, a wetland of which only a few vestiges remain. Imagine how, at the time, the heath stretched over a million hectares, a million hectares of wetlands with open expanses as far as the eye can see, where shepherds and their animals roamed. It was really quite unique. This immense marshy plain had a bad reputation. It was the presumed source of countless illnesses, earning it the nickname of unhealthy desert. But what convinced Napoleon III to plant millions of pine trees in the land had nothing to do with hygiene. It may sound rather simplistic, but it was purely commercial. We all know the saying, if you want to kill your dog, blame rabies. The heartlands of the Londe were blamed for every evil, malaria, disease, a range of afflictions. It was said people lived poorly here, but actually there was an entire functioning culture. And they took a rural pastoral economy with its culture and way of life and turned it into a forest culture. With the Industrial Revolution in full swing, the maritime pine was looked upon as the golden tree. Its timber was used to build railways, and its resin turned into turpentine, which the budding chemical industry was particularly eager for. In 1857, a gigantic planting scheme began that would radically change the culture and economy of the entire region. The inhabitants of the Londe went from being shepherds to resin collectors and lumberjacks. A hundred and fifty years after its creation, the pine forest is still the driving economic force in Aquitaine. The extraction of resin, which became too costly in terms of manpower, has been replaced by timber operations for building and the paper industry. The timber sector currently employs over 30,000 people and provides France's industry with nearly half the wood it needs. Passed on from generation to generation, the land forest is privately owned, currently divided up into nearly 50,000 properties. Jean Juillon is 72. He comes from one of the oldest families involved in exploiting the land forest. I have memories of coming here with my grandfather for the first time. He taught me how to tell the difference between the vegetation on good land and not so good land. He taught me a lot. From the 60s to the 80s, the forest was a busy place. There were resin collectors, lumberjacks. They felled the trees by hand, so there were lots of them. The forest was a lively place. You heard shouts, singing. You'd see people walking everywhere in it. Everyone would call out. The ambience was very pleasant. Trees are life. We watch them grow from year to year. That's what makes life and what makes us proud. These trees are 65 years old and were planted by our ancestors, our fathers. My grandfather also helped plant these. I was young and I saw him plant here. 
The trees are Jean Jouillon's pride and joy. A sense he has passed on to his son, Jasmin, who'll soon take over the operation. The two of them are marking trees in a plot of land to prepare for thinning. The other one's nicer. Here's the nicest one. One forty. One forty. One sixty. One sixty. Lots of branches. Yes, there are. There are a few like that. There's one meter, over one meter less compared to the other. See? Look at the difference. Thinning gives the trees vitality. You start with 1,250 pines per hectare and end up 60 years later with 250 or 300 per hectare. It gives them light and lets them grow big and tall. It's indispensable because without light, the pines would stagnate, uh, like all plants. Working a plot my grandfather planted is a real pleasure. It's, it's amazing, a real blessing. 160. 160, okay. I learned how to mark pines with my father. I do it exactly the way my grandfather did, the way the resin collectors did. The technique's been handed down over the ages. Good circumference, but big knots. Yes, the knots are big. For a forester, this is one of the best moments. Being with your son, marking trees, talking together, asking, what do you think? It's satisfying for us. The payoff is beautiful pines with nice trunks. In the Land, every tree farmer's main concern is increasing the profitability of their land. In other words, producing the best pines, perfectly straight and without too many branches. To do so, they endeavor to improve the variety. Sylvie culturists have an ally in their quest for the ideal tree, scientific research. Annie Raffin, an engineer with the INRA, the National Institute for Agricultural Research, helms a program aimed at improving the maritime pine. Patient selection and controlled breeding have led to trees that are better adapted to forest exploitation. The INRA began improving the maritime pine in 1960. The first step was to select trees that stood out from their neighbors in terms of size, straightness, and perfect branches. Technicians scoured the Londe and located these trees, harvested branches from them, and grafted them many times. Grafting is a reproductive technique that allows several exact copies of the same tree to be obtained in order to pass on its complete genetic makeup to seedlings. By grafting branches from the best adult pines, their qualities can be widely distributed. Only pines with the same ideal genetic profile must be crossed. A lot of hard work goes into selective reproduction, which has nothing to do with nature. The flowers are isolated in airtight bags then artificially fertilized by injecting pollen from the male pines inside. This is the only way to guarantee the correct genetic makeup is passed on. <laughs> <laughs> 
In our selection program, we have to monitor the pedigrees of individual trees to know exactly who their parents and grandparents were, since it's imperative not to cross two related individuals. Because, like animals, trees suffer from consanguinity. And breeding two siblings together will result in a family that has trouble growing and thriving afterwards. But before the right crossbreedings can be performed, specimens with the perfect profile must be located. Forty years ago, the INRA selected 700 exceptionally upright and robust pines. Today, these trees have fathered much of the Lond forest. I recognize this tree. It's a solid parent that's been bred many times. I know some of these trees because I've used them for interbreeding. Today, we see their descendants. After me, someone will continue the selection process with the following generations. A selection program for a forest tree is on a very long time scale. Between the time we cross two good parents and the time the best descendants are ready in an improved variety, it can take 20 years for a complete selection cycle. That means that today, we are already looking into trees that will be able to grow in the climate of 2050. The goal is to provide the tree farmer with improved varieties, improved for growth, straightness, adaptation to environmental conditions, in a way that supports lumber production in Aquitaine. By joining forces, Scientists and silviculturists have met the challenge of productivity. Whereas at the start of the 20th century, it took 60 years before the pines were ready to be cut, today they reach maturity after 40 years. For Jean Jouillon and his son, today is a big day. They're clear cutting. To observe clear cutting is to understand the logic behind the perfect geometry of the Lond forest. The pines were planted in rows to facilitate the movement of equipment, and the distance between each row was calculated to accommodate the movements of the tree felling equipment. It's part of the natural cycle of the forest. We fell the trees and then replant five years later on average. Clearing a forest after you've spent time marking the trees is satisfying. But later when you see the bare land, it gives you a little pang. It doesn't last more than a month, the time it takes to replant. Once you replant, you don't think about it anymore. The alternation of thinning, clear-cutting and replanting sets the tempo in this forest operation. Without constant human attention, the forest is vulnerable. Left to its own devices, disaster ensues. 1949, the war had forced tree farmers off their land and few had returned. The forest was cluttered with dead wood and undergrowth. That summer was particularly dry and the people here today remember what ensued. The fire destroyed nearly half the forest and claimed 82 lives. But the lesson wasn't lost, and 60 years later, the Lond Forest is considered a model in firefighting tactics. Our mission is to cut the right flank of the fire and put up a tip, okay? Firemen train every day in order to be prepared. Dozens of watchtowers have been built, and 500 strategically placed wells provide firefighters with the water they need. The concerted action of public authorities and foresters has created 28,000 kilometers of trails that firefighters use on practically a daily basis. <laughs> 
Since the system has been in place, the number of fires has dropped considerably. The tree farmers themselves formed an association and helped us set up the forest trails, which are strategic for us, because they let us get right inside the forest to each plot. So they helped us set this up and also the forest wells, which provide water for our fire trucks, and let us fight fires more effectively. The results obtained by the close cooperation between silviculturists and firefighters prove it's possible to solve the complex problems a forest the size of the Lande presents. The special feature of our southwest technique is that it is based on the topography of the forest that allows us to penetrate right into it. The forest is relatively maintained and relatively flat, so the trucks can drive through the undergrowth. They can go where the fire is, unlike other forest fighting techniques, notably in the southeast, where the topography forces you to wait for the fire on trails and paths and try to stop it at those spots. These innovative measures have come just in time, considering that today, global warming has increased periods of drought. Since its creation, the forest has never been at such a high risk of fire. But although fire can be managed by human intervention, there's another foe no one can do anything about, wind. In just two decades, the forest has suffered four catastrophic windstorms. The most violent, Cyclone Klaus, blasted across the Lande on January the 24th, 2009. Some gusts were close to 200 kilometers per hour. The consequences were tragic. 12 casualties and nearly 400,000 hectares of forest destroyed. The destructive power of the wind was multiplied by another factor, the dampness of the ground in winter. In soil softened by rain, the wind toppled the trees one on top of the other, and they fell like dominoes. For the silviculturists of the Lande, January the 24th, 2009, was an electroshock that raised a crucial question. Was the storm a meteorological oddity or a sign of things to come? Each time Jean Juillon returns to a plot of land which still hasn't been replanted, he recalls that terrible night where he nearly lost everything. One morning, I was making the rounds of this plot and saw the results of Klaus. We lost nearly two hectares of pines that were on the ground. We were devastated when we saw the trees down, broken. It was a sight we'd never seen, a war scene. A peculiar sight that's hard to accept. We didn't know what to do, whether we should continue our operation like before. At first, I had doubts. Since the storm of 2009, all the land foresters have had doubts. In a future where the devastation caused by storms will become more and more frequent, is the land forest sustainable? To determine why the damage was so extreme in the Lande, scientists wanted to take a closer look at the maritime pine, and particularly its roots. <laughs> <laughs> 
The roots make up almost half the tree. They play an important role in terms of water and mineral absorption, but also for stability. In the Land and even in Europe, stability is a major problem because it's the greatest cause of damage in forests, more so than insects or fire. In Europe, it's wind, storms. How much do you think that was going to be? With that circumference and height? Mm, two or three tons? Engineers with the INRA have set up tests to understand a fundamental feature. The maritime pine's ability to resist wind. These winches are able to tear out trees the way gale winds would. Our first goal with these measurements is to understand why they fall. We had huge amounts of damage in our forest with the trees that fell, and we want to understand how they fall and what factors make a tree fall more easily or not. Is it genetic? Is it the way it's been planted? Is it something else, such as plantation density? Uprooting the trees also gives insight into the soil structure of the Land Forest. The soil is loose and sandy and doesn't provide much grip for the pine roots whose development is limited by the very shallow phreatic zone in these former marshlands. But another phenomenon also explains the weak anchoring of the maritime pine. A rock-hard layer that has accumulated over the centuries beneath the action of the rainwater washing the sand. Alios, a type of sandstone. Alios acts like a mineral shield between 40 centimeters and a meter deep that the pine roots can't manage to pierce through. Here's the diameters 50, 42, 33, 17, 13. A computer model of the root system gives a better understanding of how maritime pines adapt to the constraints of the land soil. The tree's main root, called the taproot, is quickly blocked by alios, while lateral roots develop horizontally just a few centimeters below the surface. The roots of the tree stop growing within its first few years. In the Land Forest, it's not uncommon that a tree standing 50 meters tall is only anchored a few dozen centimeters deep in the soil. The weak rooting of the pine is one reason it's so fragile in the wind. But it's not the only reason. Yves Bruyne is a researcher with the INRA who studies the impact of windstorms on the forest as a whole. His tools, anemometers and sensors placed atop an observation tower. Wind is a meteorological phenomenon, first driven by differences in atmospheric pressure. Then when it arrives near the ground, it can be modified by the presence of trees, vegetation, buildings and so on. When wind reaches a forest, for instance, it is slowed by the mechanical action of the trees. There is very little wind right along the ground, while above the forest there is still a lot. So at the top of the forest there's a huge variation in wind velocity. There's a lot of wind shear and that's what generates turbulence. The research at the INRA has helped us to understand how wind picks up velocity and why it has such an impact in some places. With a few gusts, 
The wind starts to knock down one tree, then two, then three. We get a characteristic hole where the wind gets funneled in and accelerates, and at that point starts attacking the forest more seriously. We notice holes in the direction of the wind, which some people call wind corridors. That happens rather frequently. The parceling up of the land and the difficulty of coordinating action for the forest as a whole are other weak points of the Lond forest. To anticipate the next windstorm, researchers are already imagining wind impact on a different scale, that of the entire forest. Foresters have thought a lot on the scale of the parcel. We're interested in a larger scale, that of the forest scape, the entire forest. We try to understand if the amount of fragmentation of the forest can have an impact on its wind resistance. When you go about in the land, you see the forest is not continuous. There are cornfields, homes, clearings, there's a lot of variety. Depending on our results, we could begin recommending plots be grouped together, coordinated cutting, things like that. In an environment where the forest is extremely fragmented and divided with lots of small properties, it's not necessarily a very easy thing to get people to accept. While climate upheavals concern all foresters, some of them are even starting to reconsider the very basis of the land forest itself. Jacques Azera, owner of 200 hectares of forest, is one of them. The night of the cyclone, I immediately realized that I was going to have to change something if I wanted to remain in the forestry business. Concerned by the losses caused by windstorms, Jacques Azera has considered every alternative strategy. One alone has retained his attention. Pro-silver silviculture, based on forest management that respects natural processes of forest growth and regeneration. But natural forest means several varieties of trees in the same plot of land. A principle that goes against the purpose of the land forest founded on the monoculture of maritime pines. Here I'm pruning a nice oak tree. It's on a plot of my land which contains a healthy mix of varieties. We have the oak here, but a little further on there are pines and a few ash. A relatively large blend of varieties. Broadleafs have a very important influence on how a forest functions. For instance, in a forest of maritime pines, even just a few broadleafs will help enrich the soil a bit. In other words, broadleafs develop when the soil is a little more fertile than next door. And then once they're there, their presence improves the quality of the soil. So having them improves the conditions for growing maritime pines. Let's bear in mind that in this region, the maritime pine is the largest variety for almost every tree farmer, and that's why a very powerful commercial and industrial sector exists. Polyculture opens up new perspectives, but it also represents a radical rupture with the forestry model that has been in operation for decades. To change the forest, you must first change the people. And in the land, habits die hard. But a parasite could possibly change everything. With the 21st century, a phenomenon already well known to lumberjacks has exploded to the point of decimating entire ecosystems, biological invasions. Entomologist Hervé Jactel has been closely studying the destructive insects that have invaded the Londres. 
Most of the world's forests are currently experiencing a massive increase in public health risks, and the land forest is no exception. This is linked to two major phenomena, first, climate change, and second, biological invasions. Climate change means a rise in temperatures that favor insects because they make more generations per population, so greater proliferation, which means more damage to trees. Biological invasions are all the insects that are introduced during commercial exchanges, containers that arrive in ports and airports. The insects emerge from these introductory zones and head to the forest where they develop epidemics because they aren't regulated by their natural enemies. Heading up the list of the pine forest's enemies is a parasite well known to tree farmers, the pine processionary caterpillar. The Land Forest is the ideal environment for this fearsome herbivore. The maritime pine is perfect, as conifers are the habitat of choice for these voracious insects. They spin their cocoons in the branches and feed on its needles. Colonies of pine processionaries weaken the trees they infest by devouring their leaves each day. Even if the tree doesn't die, it's weakened by the attack, it develops poorly, and becomes an easy prey for other pests. The fight against processionary caterpillars is urgent, and not an easy one, especially in a forest as vast as the Lond. But rather than reflect upon treatment with insecticides, Scientists are looking at the defenses developed by the ecosystem itself. Research on pine forests throughout the world have led to a surprising observation. Damage caused by processionary caterpillars is much greater in forests planted exclusively of pines than in forests where several varieties of tree grow. Hervé Jactel decided to look into the predators of this destructive pest. I'm installing a clutch of processionary pine eggs that came from a lab here onto a branch of maritime pine. Comparing different ecosystems will help determine which ones the processionary's enemies thrive best in. The goal is to understand why there is more predation among blends of maritime pines and broadleafs, notably birch, than in pure pine populations. The great tit is one of the rare birds that dare attack the nests of processionary caterpillars with their fearsome, irritating hairs. Only the hoopoe is more effective. It digs up cocoons hidden in the soil, destroying nearly 70% of processionary larvae. Unfortunately, these two types of birds have a hard time adapting to a forest comprised exclusively of maritime pines. What we aim to do is put up a preventative biological fight, consisting of diversifying the varieties of forest trees to offer different habitats for the natural enemies that live in mixed forests and can thus naturally control any type of destructive insect that attacks the maritime pine, be it the processionary pine, bark beetle, or other potentially invasive insect that could find its way into our forests. Although the processionary caterpillar makes foresters nervous, the threat of an even more voracious parasite looms over the land forest, the pine wilt nematode. This microscopic worm has already decimated entire forests in Japan. It penetrates the tree itself and dries it up by blocking the circulation of water. Today, it has arrived at the threshold of Europe. It travels in the abdomen of certain longhorn beetles, which are already here. One of them is the monocamus, or soya beetle. Soyas are what we call insect vectors of the nematode. The nematode may be exotic from China, but the vector, the insect, has always been present in Europe. It's indigenous. The pine wilt nematode is currently only in Portugal, where it was introduced and discovered in 1999. It multiplies extremely fast, a generation every five days, and it can kill a tree within three weeks. 
It's very important for us to estimate the soya's movements, to know how quickly the nematode can spread. We determined the soya beetle has an extraordinary flight capacity, up to 40 kilometers per generation. That means the front can advance by 40 kilometers a year, which explains that it will gradually reach Spain and arrive in France sooner or later. In Portugal, despite control measures, chemical treatments, and the establishment of safety zones, the nematode has spread throughout the entire country in five years. For the Land, there is only one potential defense, boost the forest's resistance by diversifying it. We now know that mixed forests with several varieties of tree have a lot more advantages than simply controlling pests. For example, they're often more productive, more resistant to drought, they're also home to greater biodiversity. They're often more inviting for people too. So there are many advantages to silviculture that isn't based on a monoculture, but that associates different tree varieties. When the Land Forest was created, biodiversity wasn't on the agenda yet. And perhaps that is the forest's Achilles heel. The coastal forests that were planted in the 19th century are monospecific, mainly with maritime pines and a relatively modest understory with a bit of heather, some ferns and a few strawberry trees. But it lacks compartments of the ecosystem, so these forests are relatively more sensitive. A more diverse forest has huge ecological advantages. But in the eyes of forest operators, the determinating factor of these more natural foresting practices remain the increase in profitability. I practice a form of tree farming that's as close to nature as possible. What that means is I consider the ecosystem to be my real production tool. It isn't the tractors I take into the forest that are going to harm and damage it. If I manage to have ecosystems that are in their most natural state possible, that's where they'll be the most effective and productive. My concerns are economic. I aim to live off my forest. But to do so, I can't ignore the conditions of growth, the soil, the climate, the wildlife there, the plant diversity. It's all one big hole. In the end, if all that is working well, my earnings are improved. My production goals are what is the highest, the most noble, the most profitable type of wood. Knowing that a tree you've known, that you've raised, cut and sold or used yourself, knowing that that tree has become timber and is now part of a house or a piece of furniture, a stairway or desk, now obviously that's highly satisfying. There's an important emotional aspect, but that's not all. There's also the fact that when we use the wood for beams or rafters, the time it takes the tree to grow, say 80 years, well that's 80 years of carbon gas trapped from the atmosphere and stored underfoot in the tree. Then if we make beams from it, that means another 100 or 200 or 300 years the carbon is stored and doesn't make it into the ozone layer. So it's an important contribution to the climate, to the evolution of our societies. By letting nature do its job, Jacques Azera has revived a type of forest that greatly resembles the original Land Forest. The one that covered a tiny part of the land long before man planted a million hectares of maritime pines. <laughs> <laughs>
only a few islets of this ancient forest ecosystem remain around the dune. One of its last vestiges lies in the north of the region, near Kuso Pond. This original forest has always stood up well to storms, fires and parasite infestations. With a rich multitude of animal and plant species, could this forest have something to teach us? Here we pass through a little clump of royal fern. We're going to follow along the dune. To the right are eagle ferns, which are found everywhere in the land forest. Royal ferns are more rare and restricted to cool, damp areas. They lend a bit of a tropical aspect. Here we are in what we call a natural forest that appeared shortly after the formation of the old parabolic dunes around 1500 years ago. It's a natural forest made up of species we see around us. Maritime pine, which is native to the region, pedunculate oak, birch, evergreen oak, strawberry trees. There's a range of varieties. The ecosystem had time to develop with all its components and diversity. It's an asset because these are living forests, forests in which we find several classes of vertebrates and invertebrates, so an abundance of animal and plant life. And that is indeed a plus. In this original islet, the forest contains all the elements necessary for its balance. Thanks to them, it has better withstood storms and parasite infestations and has spontaneously regenerated after fires. It is man's responsibility to guarantee the future of the artificial pine forest he created. The diversification of tree varieties is not the only solution to these problems, but it is time to understand that to fully realize the potential of the land forest, be it ecological or economical, Man has everything to learn from the complex and perfect equation created by nature itself. <laughs>